Nursing tips for oxygenation system. So look at that. Nursing tips for oxygenation. Basically, I'm going to read to you some of the stuff that I learned today when I was reading um, my textbook. Um, first principle is oxygenation will decrease with airway obstructions. First, you got to think about how it go. the oxygen gets into your body. First, it's the nose and the mouth. And it goes to the pharynx, then the larynx, then the trachea. Splits off to the left and right main bron bronchi. Then goes to the bronchioles. Then it goes to the bronchi. Then the alveolar ducts, which will eventually lead to uh, the alveoli, which are the air sacs. So on the right side of your lung, so you have um, uh, three lobes, right upper, right middle, and left lower. On the left side, you only have the left upper lobe and the left lower lobe because the heart is taking up some of that space. Um, a healthy patient, oxygen is inhaled is adequate. CO2 exhaled is the excess CO2. Um, blood gas samples are used to measure the amount of gas exchange. Airway obstruction can impede oxygenation, so dyspnea means difficulty in breathing. Um, acute airway obstruction would be, example would be asthma. Um, chronic airway obstruction would be bronchitis or emphysema. Um, airway, obst airway obstruction is, uh, can be fully reversible with acute asthmatic attacks but may not be reversible in chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Bronchial asthma is an intermittent airway obstruction or narrowing, a narrowing of the airway. Constriction of the bronchial smooth muscle and mucosal edema that results in a bronchial spasm. So basically it's like small shrinking of your bronchioles. Um, and then ac actually that leads to decreased oxygenation. So intris there's intrinsic asthma and extrinsic asthma. Intrinsic asthma is affected by the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system, um, when that is stimulated, it relaxes the bronchial smooth muscle, which I think is a good thing. Um, a parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system when that is stimulated it constricts the bronchial smooth muscle which then leads to an asthma attack because the bronchial muscles are actually uh, constricted and this is what we have to have to be careful for um, this is caused by the intrinsic asthma is caused by things like an in inhaled in irritant weather changes um, infection uh, emotions or uh, some exercise, you know, like running and stuff sometimes. That's intrinsic asthma. Now, extrinsic asthma uh, are caused by external factors like allergens, pollens, dust, feathers, things that like are, are um, allergens, like outside, you go outside in springtime and you, you're allergic to the pollen outside, you can get asthma. So they suggest that you wash the, clo the kids' clothing after they go play outside if they're asthmatics. Um, signs and symptoms would be um, non-productive cough, so they're just coughing, um, wheezing, um, chest tightness, and feelings of shortness of breath. Uh, wheezing is then prolonged during expiration because of an obstructed airway. Um, in severe attacks, wheezing is going to decrease as dyspnea increases. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, this is a serious signs and symptoms of complete airway obstruction. So, severe uh, asthma attacks, if wheezing starts to decrease, then dyspnea or difficulty of breathing is increasing. That's a very bad sign. Um, hypoxia, signs and symptoms, use of respiratory muscles, of uh, acute restlessness, because the brain is having less oxygen, anxiety, and confusion. These are signs of hypoxia. So look for the use of the accessory muscles right here. Right here, you can see like, you know, you can see like the neck muscles, like the muscles around here, like really straining to get more oxygen. And then the rib cage, look at the rib cage if that's like, you know, 
too much. Um, one thing you should know is never use sedatives to uh, decrease anxiety in asthmatics. Um, using a sedative can actually further decrease the respiratory status of an asthmatic, so don't do that. And then there's this thing called pulsus paradoxus. It is when the systolic blood pressure upon inspiration is greater than 10 millimeters of mercury of the systolic blood pressure upon expiration. So when you're inspiring, if your systolic blood pressure is more than 10 above when it is when you're expiring, um, then that's actually called pulsus paradoxus. Look it up. Um, ongoing assessments are invaluable in recognizing and preventing the progression of asthma attack. Uh, you know, so basically, always uh, recognize the progression of an asthma attack if your patient has an asthma attack. Um, the second principle is oxygenation is decreased when respiratory status is affected by a disease, uh, which will lead to damaged lung function. So. Oxygenation is decreased when the person has a disease that is affecting the respiratory system. And to keep the adequacy of oxygenation depends on three things. One is oxygen. Two is hemoglobin. Three is cardiac output. So um, a chronic respiratory disease, uh, the signs and symptoms of that is fatigue, shortness of breath upon exertion, so if they start moving and stuff, they start having shortness of breath, that's not good. And then a decreased ability to perform ADLs, activities of daily living, because they can't breathe. Um, the most common type of chronic respiratory disease is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Signs and symptoms are similar, but more uh, malintent or mal-progressive than the regular chronic respiratory disease signs and symptoms. Um, we have increased airway resistance, dyspnea, easily fatigue, wheezing, uh, non-productive cough. Chronic bronchitis is when mucus replaces surfactant. Um, so if it, if it replaces surfactant, it's the, there's less elasticity in your alveoli. So it's actually harder for them to breathe. Um, emphysema is a permanently enlarged alveolar sex. So emphysema is more down to the, the alveoli level where it's messing things up. Um, is decreased elasticity because of de uh, decreased surfactant and increased mucus. So air trapping occurs because they can't, um, you know, exhale. The, the, the alveoli cannot retract and push out the air. So basically, air trapping occurs. Pursed lip breathing is used to eliminate excess air. So they have to breathe like this, like. You know, to get the excess air out. Um, constant shortness of breath. You, you have to do ongoing assessments of respiratory rate, changing patterns of the depth, and changes in breathing. Uh, treatment are to encourage them to stop smoking, give them adequate hydration so they can uh, kind of like get rid of all the mucus and can dissipate and um, well not dissipate but it will get thinner. Um, mobilization of secretions by suctioning, ch chest physical therapy CPT and encourage a patient to cough. Um, the third principle is oxygen therapy is necessary to restore oxygenation when oxygenation is impaired. So you need to give oxygen therapy when their oxygenation is decreased. Uh, the purpose is to increase the percentage of oxygen in the alveoli and the capillaries. Prevent or reduce hypoxia, uh, work of breathing, and decrease myocardial workload. Too much oxygen to a COPD patient can cause damage to them because you can decrease the hypoxic drive. Um, and you can increase CO2 retention and increase respiratory depression. So too much oxygen to a COPD patient will decrease hypoxic drive. You don't want that because you're basically telling the brain to stop breathing. There's enough oxygen there when there's not really enough oxygen. You're just giving the artificial oxygen so they still need to breathe. So don't give them too much oxygen. Um, FiO2 percentage 
of oxygen delivered to the lungs. On room air, so FiO2 is the percentage of oxygen delivered to the lungs. Room air is 21% FiO2. The FiO2 treatments can vary between 24% to 100% of oxygen that you're going to deliver to the patient. And um, before you administer oxygen, you should get a, a blood gas prior to doing that. Um, high flow O2 is you cannot be influenced by a patient's breathing pattern if you're using high flow O2 therapy. Um, when used, this is the only oxygen that a patient is breathing. So if a patient is using high flow O2, um, this is the only thing that the patient is breathing, you're breathing for them basically. Um, low flow O2, it's between 21 and 100% oxygen and there's a lack of accuracy, accuracy depending and dependability as opposed to a high flow system. Different types of uh, devices you can use are a nasal cannula. It's a low flow O2 device. Uh, the treatments are between one and six liters of oxygen. You never want to go more than six liters of oxygen because you can dry the mucosa. Um, simple O2 mask is a low flow O2 system. The FiO2 given with a, with a simple O2 mask is 24 to 60 percent oxygen. Um, FiO2. You can place the it over the mouth and nose and most common low flow, this is the most common low flow system that is used. There's something called the Venturi mask which is actually a high flow um, system and it treats between 70 to 90 percent of oxygen you can administer to the patient. The only mask available to the delivery, this is the only mask available to deliver exact amounts of FiO2 to your patient and it is indicated for a COPD patient. Um, so whenever you have a COPD patient, usually they're gonna be using a Venturi mask. An oxygen mask with a reservoir is another type of mask. It is a high flow system. It delivers between 70 to 90% uh, of oxygen and used for a patient with severe hypoxia. Used mostly with a patient that has had smoke inhalation or CO2 poisoning. Um, so that's that right there. And then the endotracheal tube is also a high flow system. Any concentration of oxygen can be delivered to patients directly through the throat. Uh, most, effective message, most effective method of O2 administration for severely hypoxic patients. Pros are to prevent, to prevent aspiration, uh, direct suctioning, so um, basically it's really good for preventing um, aspiration and giving direct suctioning. Uh, if oxygen levels drop, if your O2 saturation drops during suctioning, you should discontinue the suctioning and administer O2 to the patient because you want to resaturate the arterial blood. So that means you've been giving, you've been suctioning too much of the oxygen out of their you know, respiratory system and you've depleted the oxygen in their hemoglobin so you want to imme immediately stop suctioning, give them oxygen, resaturate the blood, get them going before you suction again. And then um, too much CO2 or a decrease in O2 leads to respiratory acidosis. You don't want that. It's bad. All right, and then for emphysema patients with oxygen therapy at home, you should suggest a constant oxygen flow rate. You don't want them to, to increase the oxygen flow rate if they're having shortness of breath because again, that will decrease the hypoxic drive and stop them from wanting to breathe or needing to breathe. Their body's just gonna stop breathing. Um, their oxygen tubing should be changed on a periodic basis on a regular interval, not um, like every day or whatever. It's whatever the interval is, it should be constant and regular basis. Um, a child with laryngeotracheal bronchitis, um, if you want to dilate the airways, use cool, moist humidifier in the room. Warm air has actually not been proven to be effective and just sitting them upright um, does not really help with airway obstruction, I mean constriction. Um, cough suppressants can actually worsen the condition by increasing airway congestion. These are my tips for um, 
airway and oxygenation for nursing so hopefully it helps you if you like it click like and my youtube channel do what you do it's your boy martizi martin peace